What's Sora's favorite hobby? Sword fights on the beach? Eating ice cream? No. It's killin'. Sora loves killin' folks. He's done it so many times in his short 16 years. And really, he only started killin' at 14, so he's gotten a lot done in the last, like, 24 months. And he spends a huge chunk of that time either asleep or missing. That is to say, he's a very accomplished murderer, and no group in the Kingdom Hearts series is victimized by Sora, quite like the Heartless. What's he got against them? I understand that they're like intrinsically vicious creatures born of the darkness in people's hearts, but on the other hand, they are literally just little guys. But the littler the guys are, the riper they are for slaughter at the hands or dull teeth of the Keyblade. I got to wondering, as one does, about how many Heartless have met their end thanks to crossing paths with Sora. For most of my life, I was satisfied with a bunch as the answer, but my brain rot runs deep now. Like, I think I have cage spine rot at this point. It's just really bad. So, the next logical step after self-diagnosing yourself with cage spine rot is to figure out, to the highest degree of accuracy possible, exactly how many Heartless have been defeated by Sora. Now, we can probably reasonably assume that Sora actually does a lot more murdering than we see on screen. Like, if you shut off your console, he probably gets bored. The games would likely have us believe that Sora's exterminated many more Heartless than we actually get to see, but we're going to assume for this exercise that only what we see is what we get. So, I'm going to be doing exactly what it sounds like. I played through Kingdom Hearts 1, 2, and 3 and figured out the minimum amount of Heartless that Sora could have possibly killed. And yeah, we'll talk about those ones later. This may sound like a considerable undertaking, but I just got done watching every cutscene in the series and marking down each time something might be considered funny, so this was like a brisk jog for me. I could front load the video with a bunch of explanations about any caveats and stipulations, but I think it'll be easier to just address them when they pop up. So if you have any questions or concerns, please save them until the end of the presentation slash murder montage. And just for fun, why don't you come up with a guess before we get started, and then at the end of the video you can let me know how close you were. I'll give you a hint, it's gonna be more than a thousand. Alright, make room in the morgue, Sora's been having some weird thoughts lately, and they're angry thoughts. Let's start, as human history did, with Kingdom Hearts 1. Oh, now, assuming dreams do count, Sora draws first blood on the Cinderella platform of his dive to the heart, where he kills five shadows. As much as I'd like to avoid slaughtering the poor guys, the game will literally heal you until you do, so these deaths are unavoidable. But they're dream deaths, so not so bad, right? This is followed by an additional nine shadows on the Aurora platform, and then we run into our first caveat on the Bell platform, where Darkseid appears. I think regardless of which way the fight goes, it would be a bit of a stretch to count this Darkseid. Even if you win, Darkseid hardly looks defeated, like he's literally still throwing punches after the bell rings, so if anything, I think this is a draw. I should mention, Darkseid can spawn more shadows with his little punch portals, and you can totally kill those shadows, but for the purposes of this project, we will not be doing that. Oddly enough, in setting out to track Sora's murders, I ended up doing what was essentially a soft challenge run of the number titles where I tried to be as pacifistic as possible. You can consider this the most charitable assessment of Sora's rap sheet. With that in mind, we leave Sora's dream with a kill count of 14 shadows. As for Destiny Islands, we once again have something of a dark side conundrum. While you absolutely must win this fight to progress, and Darkseid definitely looks more subdued here than in the dream, it doesn't look like Sora actually kills it. That honor seems to go to the giant apocalypse ball that haunted my nightmares. So, continuing to be charitable, Sora leaves his island with no additional casualties, as you can avoid killing any more shadows once you acquire the Keyblade. Arriving in Traverse Town, we come to one of the more infamous progression barriers in KH1, which is the criteria you need to satisfy to move on to the Leon fight. As a kid, I always thought you just had to make it to the 3rd District, I know others thought you needed to see all the different scenes of Donald and Goofy just missing Sora, but in actuality, you just need to pop in the 2nd District, kill 5 shadows, and then turn back around. After that, nothing else needs to die until you meet up with Donald and Goofy. Upon which we have the 6 soldiers who open for the guard armor, and then the guard armor itself. And I know what you're thinking, wait a sec, you can just have Donald and Goofy do all the killing, all Sora would have to do is kill the bosses. And to that I say, if I ever need to do a murder, I'll keep you in mind for someone to aid and abet me. Listen, I don't have the patience to be this pedantic. If the people I'm with are killing folks and I don't stop them, I'm still guilty. So yes, you could hypothetically kill zero soldiers here as Sora, but keep in mind that anything your party members kill will go towards your journal kill count regardless. Jiminy was actually a huge help in keeping track of all this. So with that all in mind, aiding and abetting counts. But to make this easier on myself, and here's a tip if you want to do this too, for whatever reason, 
I set D&G's AI to be as useless as possible, kept them weak and squishy, left them with default weapons, and I would match Triangle to keep their focus on me instead of enemies whenever running through an area with optional heartless spawns. With that, Traverse Town 1 is done, and we leave with a kill count of 26. Now, you may be asking, what about Gummy Heartless? Doesn't matter, you don't have to kill a single one to beat this game, so my client Sora has obviously done no such thing. We arrive safely in Wonderland with no guts on our windshield. And for a world ruled by a psychopathic queen, Wonderland is surprisingly peaceful for our purposes here, as the only thing that needs to die is the Trick Master at the very end. It's fairly easy to get the minimum of one evidence box without killing anything through a bit of movement trickery, and the only other potential obstacle is lighting the lamps, but this can also be done with no casualties. There will be other occasions where we're forced to murder because our command menu is red instead of blue, but for now we don't have to wonder about such morbid things. We leave with 27 kills. Okay, so Olympus Coliseum definitely throws a wrench into things, and brace yourself now, this is where the kill count will diverge. Apparently, alternate world lines are a thing in this series now, so I don't see why we can't have two separate kill counts. By that I mean, we're going to continue to track Sora's murders through the most charitable lens possible in the gameplay sense, but Olympus creates a pretty big wrinkle here considering you never once have to set foot in this world to beat Kingdom Hearts 1. And yet, canonically, Sora has absolutely been to Olympus prior to Chain of Memories, considering he has memories of the place, and judging from the trophies present in Cage 2, he also conquered every single tournament. And a lot of killing goes down in these tournaments. So I figure if we're gonna do this exercise, we might as well try to arrive at two answers. One for getting by doing as little harm as possible, and one for doing that but also not cutting out chunks of very canon stuff. So for now, we're going to focus on that first count, get our first answer, and then I'll add on all of the bloody and gory toppings at the end to get our second answer. But yes, contrary to what we may have thought as kids, Olympus Coliseum is entirely optional and has no bearing on being able to progress to the Traverse Town Revisit and Agrabah. Deep Jungle, on the other hand, must always be completed, and the world is fairly peaceful for the first half of it until the gorillas are threatened by the Power Wilds. Unfortunately, Sora values the lives of these gorillas over the Heartless, so we have to kill 27 Power Wilds, doubling our kill count. That's 5 at the camp, 6 at the climbing trees, 5 in the treehouse, 5 at the cliff, and 6 in the bamboo thicket. Thankfully, those are the only Power Wilds we need to kill though, as the little event with the evil eggplant only requires you to destroy the fruit. Four Power Wilds do show up during the first phase of the Clayton fight, but you just need to damage Clayton a bit to move on to phase two. Technically, the Power Wilds are gone in the next cutscene, but I choose to believe they just despawned. And then Stealth Sneak is kind of interesting, because you can end the fight by depleting Clayton's HP, but even though you may not actually kill the Stealth Sneak, it's gonna die in the next cutscene regardless. I don't know if the game expected you to kill it, or if the Lizard just dies of a broken heart once he sees that we've murdered Clayton. As much as I'd like to let Sora off the hook for this one, I think we've gotta count it. If every other Heartless only appears in the journal after killing one, then the Stealth Sneak fits the bill. This means we leave Deep Jungle with 55 kills to our name. Back in Traverse Town, we actually get our first case of Sora killing a Heartless in a cutscene when he, frankly badassedly, kills a Shadow during his reunion with Riku. You might think it's silly to count this, but I would argue that anything killed during a cutscene is most important. Shortly after, assuming you don't save the Traverse Town keyhole for way later, we encounter our first instance of a red command menu forcing us to murder. Ringing the bell in the second district requires us to do this red trinity, and doing this red trinity requires us to kill anything nearby that's keeping our command menu from being blue. I would not be surprised if you could somehow get some or one of these prismatic melodies to be out of range but kept from D and respawning, but I could not figure out a way to make that happen reliably. This means we need to kill two red nocturnes, blue rhapsodies, yellow operas, and green requiems. And of course, after we ring the bell, we add opposite armor to our murder tally, bringing us up to 65. Over in Agrabah, while the first cutscene with Jasmine and Jafar leads to what feels like a mandatory event battle, you can just turn around and not kill anything in the alleyway. The first batch of mandatory murder takes place in the desert when rescuing Aladdin, forcing you to kill 10 bandits that emerge from the sand. After that, we're once again stuck playing red light, blue light with the command menu. That is, we need to unlock these mini keyholes throughout the city so we can progress to the pot centipede fight, but there are always heartless in the way. Once again, there might be ways to cheese this for a more peaceful outcome, but the best I could do in the alleyway was one pot spider in exchange for this keyhole. The same scenario takes place in the bazaar, which has two different spawn sets, one with regular heartless and one with black fungi. The most peaceful solution I was able to find was making sure I got the former spawn set, killing two bandits and one green requiem on this first ledge here, avoiding the bottom of the room and jumping up to unlock the keyhole.
And if you could believe it, despite the Pot Centipede being only the first of four bosses in Agrabah, it's the last Heartless we actually have to kill, though it may be annoying having to avoid fighting its Pot Spider minions throughout the fight. This means we leave Agrabah with a kill count of 80. So now we arrive at this circuit of three worlds on the right half of the map, only two of which need to be completed to move on to Neverland. Naturally, one of those worlds will be Monstro, in which Sora only has to kill one Parasite Cage. Easy enough, which brings our counter to 81 as we choose between Atlantica and Halloween Town. While a speedrun might next take us to Halloween Town, a murder crawl takes us to Atlantica, which is also pretty light on the killing, believe it or not. The first and actually only kills take place in the first room, where we need to kill five sea neons before Flounder and Sebastian will leave the giant clam. Now, you may recall that progressing through the first half of Atlantica requires hitching a ride on a dolphin who is notoriously terrified of red command menus, but you can fairly easily just get to a part of the room where no Heartless spawn and quickly press triangle before the dolphin can be disturbed. The first time, it's easiest to approach from the Undersea Garden. After that, the dolphin will swim over to the Undersea Valley, where you can intercept it underneath this arch for a free and bloodless ride to the sunken ship. And while you'll need to beat up Glut the Shark at least once to beat Atlantica, no other Heartless have to die. After Ursula steals the Trident, the world's spawns do shift around a bit, and the arch in the Undersea Valley now has Surge Ghosts underneath it. We'll need to catch another ride on the Dolphin in order to get to Ursula's lair, so this time entering the room from Tranquil Grotto and going a bit to the right is the best way to catch the Dolphin without getting the attention of any Heartless. With that, we swim that way out of Atlantica with 86 kills to our name. Okay, so what if I told you that even though Halloween Town has the most mandatory Heartless murders out of this batch of three worlds, the most pacifistic route is actually to still go to Halloween Town. Since we already cleared Monster in Atlantica, we don't need to go there to beat the game, but going to Halloween Town and completing the world means we kill fewer Heartless. How is that possible? That doesn't even make any sense. I'll let you think about this for a bit, but for now, just trust me. Halloween Town is probably the most interesting of the KH1 worlds for this exercise, with really only one straightforward encounter. Set encounter is the forced mob fight in the graveyard to get the forget-me-not from Sally, which has us killing four shadows, two search ghosts, and three white knights. The other ingredient for the doctor's artificial heart is the jack-in-the-box, which is inside a pumpkin in the cemetery. Of course, getting there requires us to pass through the graveyard again, and you need a blue command menu to enter the coffin to progress to the cemetery. However, one of the possible spawns for the room is a group of non-violent white mushrooms, so you can just stand in the room until they eventually get bored and leave. To save us the trouble for later, proceeding to Moonlight Hill and casting fire on the lift can give us a shortcut between here and the graveyard so we don't have to rig the graveyard for white mushrooms again to enter the coffin. After the delinquents steal the heart, we need to make our way to Oogie's Manor, which requires us to activate this gravestone on the Curly Hill. The room has two different spawn sets, one with native Heartless and one with black fungi, but neither seem to be entirely unmurderable. When I was testing, it seemed like I got really close to activating the gravestone when I had the black fungus set, but the menu turned red at the last second. So the best I could do here was two white knights and one gargoyle to get the hill to extend. At the manor's front door, we have a couple of white knights and gargoyles spawn, but if you jump out to the wooden platform on the left, you can get them to despawn and then very quickly hit triangle to open the door while your menu is still blue. From there, we can climb the manor like usual, fight Lock, Shock, and Barrel, and move on to the Oogie battle. And, oh man, does this blow. So, you may recall, Oogie tries to summon a bunch of Heartless in the cutscene before his boss fight, and only two Gargoyles show up. They stick around for the actual battle, and while they're still there, the battle will not progress. Given that Oogie is out of reach on elevated platforms, that's a problem. Normally, we just kill these gargoyles, step on the right button, and beat the shit out of Oogie a few times until he shits out his bugs. But here, we're hyper-conscious of our murder footprint, and we also cannot physically reach Oogie. But we can reach him magically. Yes, you can, very slowly, kill Oogie by launching fire spells at him. You'll need a few elixirs and maybe an MP-boosting accessory, but it's very doable. Of course, you need to also avoid killing the gargoyles, and this will involve mashing triangle to keep your party members away from them and preferably letting them get KO'd. Oddly enough, I do think the gargoyles can eventually despawn, as I noticed one had disappeared but was sure it hadn't been killed, and my journal kill count after the fact reflected that. So, I think if it's off-screen for long enough, it might just vanish. Point is, you can very slowly kill Oogie and spare the gargoyles. This also applies to the manor fight, which has gargoyles spawn partway through picking off the orbs. And so we leave Halloween Town with another 12 kills, bringing us to 98 total. You still might be wondering why we even went here, and I promise I'll explain soon enough. But first, Neverland, which is very straightforward. That's one anti-Sora in the captain's cabin, and then the batch of Heartless before the hook fight on the deck, which amounts to four pirates, six air pirates, and one battleship. 
The lattermost will spawn during the hook fight, but they too can be spared, so we fly away from Neverland with our kill count at 110. Hollow Bastion is a bit more interesting, with our first kill coming in the waterway where we'll need to either use magic or sick beast on this defender so we can push the button to open the door to the entrance hall. Some dark balls will spawn in base level on the way back, but using the bubble here to hide until they despawn will allow us to examine the crystal and get a ride back up to the castle gates. After dealing with the library and the emblem door, some heartless will spawn on this higher portion of the castle gates, but once again you can hide in the right spot until they go away and then examine the crystal to head upwards. Unfortunately, we've got to take an elevator ride across the Great Crest with three wizards who crave death, and we have no choice but to grant them their wish. At the high tower, we get to do one of my favorite little exploits, the Dumbo Trick, to grab onto this ledge and skip over any killing or puzzling and make our way to the Maleficent fight during which no Heartless need to be defeated. And obviously we can use that trick again on the second visit. Speaking of, the climb up the castle after the Riku Ansem fight is pretty much the same, though avoiding the Heartless and the Castle Gate's upper level is a bit trickier this time, but still doable. The elevator ride forces us to kill another wizard, plus two air soldiers and two yellow operas. After another Dumbo skip, we eventually arrive in the Dark Depths, where we'll take out the Behemoth, bringing our post Hollow Bastion kill count to 120. That brings us to End of the World, which kicks off with some heartless meteor ball things that drop from the sky, forcing us to take out four Invisibles, five Angel Stars, and finally one Arch Behemoth. Okay, here's the payoff, folks. World fucking Terminus. For those who don't know or remember, this section in End of the World called World Terminus features one room from each of the worlds with keyholes in the game. In most cases, entering these rooms is entirely optional, save for the Hollow Bastion and 100 Acre Wood rooms. Only for worlds whose keyholes you haven't locked do you have to go into its corresponding Terminus room and defeat all the Heartless inside. Since most of the keyholes are mandatory, plus Monstro not having one, this means the pillars that could potentially have an abnormal color include Olympus Coliseum, Atlantica, and Halloween Town. If you don't lock Halloween Town's keyhole, you'll have to clear out its World Terminus room, which, yes, has more mandatory enemies than the world itself. 14 in the room, 12 in the world. So in an utterly stupid twist of fate and, I guess, math, doing an entire world saves us from having to commit an additional two murders. Of course, we did not do Olympus Coliseum, and its World Terminus room has far fewer Heartless than everything in the prelims and the Phil, Pegasus, and Hercules cups. That's two Defenders, 11 Air Soldiers, and four Wyverns. The only other Terminus room we have to visit is the always mandatory Hollow Bastion Lab Room, which has six Invisibles, four in the hallway, and two near this big lore machine. After Chernabog, we arrive in the notoriously tough Linked Worlds, and when the dust settles, we add 15 Dark Balls, 15 Invisibles, 9 Angel Stars, and one more Arch Behemoth to our count. Behind the door, we can finally add a Dark Side to the count, I mean, it sort of just vanishes after you kill it in the crater, but I have no reason to believe it lived this time or died from something else. During the World of Chaos battle, you have to clear out these three room cores, all of which are filled with Pure Blood Heartless. In order, that's 15 Shadows, 15 Dark Balls, and 5 Invisibles. At least I'm pretty sure, it is, after all, very dark. And then I guess I'm counting the World of Chaos itself as just one big entity, but it does have a face and 8 artillery things if you really want to count those. And of course, Ansem himself. He may have a human-looking body, but the man is still a Heartless, and the last thing we add to our KH1 kill count, bringing us to the absolute most pacifistic number I could manage, 231. However, for a number that's maybe a bit more reflective of what's happened canonically, we need to add on all of the cups from Olympus. The prelims during the main visit add another 58 Heartless. As for the fill cup, assuming we count the pairs of gauntlets and hammer legs as one being, as the game itself does, we add another 69. The Pegasus Cup nets us another 54, and the Hercules Cup, assuming we subtract the one rare truffle, is an additional 39. Finally, the Hades Cup, minus three white mushrooms and one rare truffle, gets us another 348. So yes, you kill more Heartless during the Hades Cup than throughout the rest of every other world in the game combined. But adding these tournaments to our first as pacifistic as possible count and subtracting the Olympus World Terminus mobs gets us a grand, cannon-friendly total of 782 Heartless. Oh, right, I said we'd talk about Chain of Memories. I'm not just saying this to save myself from extra work, but I don't really think these are real Heartless. Or at least, not most of them. I mean, if all the people that Sora meets in Castle Oblivion besides the organization are just memory-based projections, I don't see why the Heartless would be any different. I just don't truly think the organization has handpicked the native Heartless that correspond with each world in Sora's memories and placed them there for him to kill. Yes, there are a handful of new Heartless that he couldn't possibly remember from his first adventure since they're not in KH1, but his memory is being fucked with. 
There were also never any springs on the floor or little tentacles on the walls of Monstro's internal organs. If anything, you might argue the 13th floor contains real Heartless since it's not based on a world that Sora or Roxas have visited, but consider, it's the last floor. By the time Sora's climbed this high up, he would have memories of what the original parts of the castle look like, and he's still using cards to create rooms on this floor. Still, even if these Heartless are real and the ones on floors 1 through 12 are fake, you could just amass all of the room cards you need on those floors, bring them to floor 13, and avoid killing any real Heartless. If you feel certain that all of the Heartless are real, then you just have to figure out the card requirements for each floor, find the random encounters with the fewest amount of spawns, and then imagine you had godlike RNG to get everything you need with minimum casualties. You have fun doing that, I'll save that video for you to do. Wow, I am such a nice man. Let's move on to Kingdom Hearts 2. So we're gonna make a lot of IGN reporters from 2006 very happy when I say that we're skipping through all of the Roxas stuff because he only ever fights nobodies. And I don't mean to be exclusionary, but like, come on, they're nobodies. They don't even exist. Plus, this video is about Sora. You can also do the video where you figure out how many Heartless Roxas is killed if you like. When we're back in our banana shoes, Sora actually doesn't fight any Heartless until arriving at the Mysterious Tower, where he'll take out 9 Shadows courtesy of Pete. Heading inside, we fight another 12 Shadows in the Star Chamber, and 5 Soldiers and 3 Shadows in the Moon Chamber. And that's actually it for Twilight Town. Anytime we're back here, we'll be fighting nobody, so we begin our second Slaughter Tour with 30 kills. We have to make a brief stop at Hollow Bastion, but the two mandatory fights here are against nobodies. I'm sure this world will always be this peaceful. I should know, unlike in KH1, KH2 and 3 have specific settings for your party members that keep them from attacking anything at all, so using that will help keep any stray killings from happening without your permission. As we hop in the gummy ship, it may seem like we'll finally have to kill some gummy heartless, but we can still get through this entire game without doing so. For one, a ton of the ships this time around have the Nobody emblem, and two, as long as you can keep your HP up, you can make it to the end of each route without ever firing your guns. Even the boss-like enemies, which may seem to block your way, will eventually fuck off if you don't kill them quickly enough. Moving on to the Land of Dragons, we sort of have to enlist in the army, so I guess you can't be too surprised when we have to kill a ton of stuff. A forced fight in the encampment takes out 7 Shadows and 2 Nightwalkers. Then we have all of these mandatory missions, which takes our kill count up a bunch. 5 Nightwalkers and 10 Shadows during the Surprise Attack, 2 Assault Riders, 5 Shadows and 5 Nightwalkers during the Ambush, and 5 Shadows and 3 Nightwalkers during the Surge. After that, we need to secure the Mountain Path on the way to the Village, and it can be super annoying and difficult, but you can do this non-violently, though you're going to get attacked just before you can use the RC on the rocks several times. Once we arrive in the village, we're forced into the cave with Ping, and we'll have to slaughter a whopping 38 shadows and 3 assault riders. Hilariously, during the segment with the rapid thrusters and bolt towers on the summit, you can just let the clock run out with no penalty whatsoever. Right before the Shan Yu fight, we've got this mandatory battle in the Imperial Square with 3 bolt towers and 4 nightwalkers. In that Shan Yu fight, there are always 3 nightwalkers spawned at the start, and they always make a beeline for the gates, which you need to keep from getting too damaged, or else the fight ends. I have to assume if you're quick enough, you can kill Shan Yu before this happens, but I could not not manage to do it. I would think that a sword with higher strength might be able to finish the job more quickly, but this would have to be contingent on him not gaining that strength through killing optional Heartless. That being said, I had to take out one of the Nightwalkers, as three was just too much for the gates to handle in the time span that we have here, but I would not be surprised if this could be done without killing any of them. With that, we leave China with our kill count now at 123. After a very bloody world, Beast Castle is refreshingly calm with only two Heartless deaths coming in the form of the world's bosses. For the Thresholder, I just counted the Possessor that uh, possessed it, and since the Shadow Stalker evolves into the Darkthorn, I counted that battle as one kill, so we leave here with 125. The game then railroads us back over to Hollow Bastion, where we absolutely must go into the 100 Acre Wood, unlike the other games. This also forces us into a mob fight in the Burrow, where we claim the lives of 7 Shadows and 3 Soldiers, bringing our kill count up to 135 as we head to Olympus Coliseum. The Underworld is pretty straightforward, as all of the mandatory kills happen during the infamous Hades chase sequence. Our dearly departed include 16 Shadows, 7 Hook Bats, 6 Lance Soldiers, and 1 Large Body. The only other moment of interest is during the Pete fight, which goes down in two phases. During the first, Meg is being chased by a bunch of Hook Bats. On a normal playthrough, you'd probably kill these, and Pete would summon some replacements. But here, we need to keep Meg from being murdered for one minute until Phase 2 can start. It can be fairly difficult, but it's entirely doable even if you need to non-lethally smack the Hook Bats once or twice to draw their attention. In Phase 2, there are some Hook Bats and Trick Ghosts that accompany Pete, and once again, it can be tricky to keep them from getting caught in the crossfire, but it can also be done. 
With our kill count now at 165, we move on to Disney Castle, and this whole trip is entirely held hostage by Minnie. Even though she's not a fully-fledged party member, anything that Minnie kills will be added to your kill counter in the journal, and she loves killing. Coupled with the fact that we also need to keep her Get Murdered bar from filling up, this is a bit of a predicament. She's inevitably going to kill stuff, so all you can really do is wave her along and hope her bloodlust isn't too powerful. I know you can, like, nudge her around a bit to push her along without using the command, but that doesn't really go far in the way of keeping her from killing stuff. During the first portion in the colonnade, after several attempts, the lowest I could manage was four shadows, which felt like a miracle, so I'm pretty happy with that. But, you know, assume that it could possibly be lower. Then in the audience chamber, I failed to save the lives of seven bolt towers from Her Majesty. Timeless River is very straightforward, as the world is essentially composed of four forced mob fights through the windows on Cornerstone Hill. I did spend way too much time trying to cheese the building site fight, because I know if you make the minute bombs blow up, you don't get experience, so I kept trying to use fire on them while avoiding using physical hits. Eventually I realized that if they blow up that way and Sora doesn't use the dodge roll RC, they'll just keep respawning here. So that's 8 minute bombs and 8 hammer frames at the building site. Then we've got 7 aeroplanes and 4 hammer frames in Lilliput, 10 shadows and 3 hot rods at the scene of the fire, and 2 shadows and 14 rapid thrusters in Mickey's house. As for the Steamboat Pete battle, as long as you never let go of the hook, Pete never spawns heartless, so that's pretty easily avoided. We go back to the future with 232 murders under our belt, already surpassing the total amount we killed in KH1. Port Royal is also pretty simple, and the big batch of casualties here comes from the forced fight in the town at the start of the visit, where we send 9 shadows, 3 cannon guns, and 2 soldiers to Davy Jones' locker. Later on, and it can be very annoying, but no Heartless need to be killed during the Burning Barrel segment, but your patience will be tested. One thing left here is the Illuminator during the Barbosa fight. Barbosa can spawn replacement Illuminators after killing the first one, but it's entirely possible to beat him without this happening. Thus, we sail away from Port Royal at 247 kills. Agrabah was surprisingly bloodier than I expected, though it makes sense when you remember the Chasm of Challenges and the Forced Treasure Room fight, the latter of which has a counter on screen for 50 Heartless victims. I thought maybe some Heartless might despawn in the Chasm if you let the floors vanish for a while, but they'll all follow you down to the bottom floor, so they've all gotta die for you to progress. That's 6 Icy Cubes, 5 Fiery Globes, 2 Fat Bandits, and 2 Fortune Tellers. Then there's the aforementioned Treasure Room with 26 Fiery Globes, 14 Icy Cubes, 7 Silver Rocks, 2 Turtle Doves, and 5 Fat Bandits. Then we have the Volcanic and Blizzard Lord battle, which is interesting in the worst way. In case you forgot, and I wouldn't blame you because normally I thought nothing of this, after you do enough damage to either of the lords, they'll burst into a cluster of their respective fire or ice mook enemy. Usually you'd probably take these guys out in a few swings and carry on, but for our purposes this injects a ton of useless anxiety into the fight. Initially I had to be very careful to not accidentally kill any globes or cubes during my finisher. But then even if they survive, there's a high chance that the lord of the opposing element will kill them through friendly fire, or ice, adding them to your journal counter and granting you experience. Hypothetically, you could coax the minions around and keep them safe until they eventually despawn, but the easier solution is to never let them spawn in the first place. As long as you avoid using finishers on the lords at certain HP thresholds, they'll never explode. This does lengthen the fight, as at certain points they'll stop taking damage and you'll have to avoid the other lords' attacks while the one you were just fighting drifts out of range. But with enough patience, you can spare the common folk and kill only the royals, and we can leave Agrabah with 316 kills. Next up is Halloween Town, which is fairly simple, unlike in KH1. I, I was talking about the world design, but I guess it goes for the murdering too. There's two forced mob fights on this visit, the first of which is in Halloween Town Square, with 11 white knights, 7 shadows, and 2 soldiers. The next is at Candy Cane Lane, with 3 driller moles and 3 toy soldiers. There's the prison keeper boss at Curly Hill, but then we reunite with Oogie. It once again seems like we might have to dispatch Oogie's employees, but this time around it's easier to avoid. As much as I hate to openly show disdain for the Oogie gifts picked out for me, whenever a Heartless bag showed up on my conveyor belt, I swapped to a different one as soon as possible. Usually the Heartless will despawn as it can't reach you, and the spikes at the end of a conveyor belt become inactive once you leave it, saving them from an accidental pointy death. They do still run the risk of being punched by the big cartoony boxing glove, but it's entirely feasible to do this with zero Heartless casualties. Sora was the one hiding under the beds of 27 Heartless here, which we add to our total for 343 kills. Now at this point, Pride Lands has opened up, but for the most peaceful outcome, we're going to avoid the world entirely, but for the purposes of the true canon kill count, I'll add those on later. This means we head back to Hollow Bastion and enter Space Paranoids, which kicks off with a light cycle tutorial that forces you to kill five Magnum Loaders. They don't get marked down in your journal, but they're pretty clearly murdered, so I will be counting them. 
The actual Light Cycle minigame can be completed without killing anything, but some loaders will surely perish due to reckless driving. The next site of Bloodshed is the Datascape, where it seems like 10 strafers is the minimum amount of kills required to get enough clusters and freeze all three screens. After that, the hostile program is not a Heartless, contrary to how it totally looks like one, and we leave the computer with 358 kills. Back in Hollow Bastion, we have a thing or two to take care of. The first victims in our way are in the corridors, which also contain nobodies, but again, who cares. That's 8 Armored Knights and 1 Crimson Jazz added to the count. This is followed by the Final Fantasy Ravine fights, and while the FF characters will add to your journal counter and grant you experience for their kills, I still decided to let them do all the fighting for me, just for fun. The efforts of Yuffie, Leon, Tifa, and Cloud add 78 Shadows, 34 Armored Knights, 13 Morning Stars, 9 Soldiers, and 7 Surveillance Robots to the Mass Grave. After that, we have this quaint little occasion noted as the battle of a couple of bad guys, netting us 54 more surveillance robots and 946 armored knights. Well, two more when you add on the ones that Sora kills in the following cutscene. That means this trip to Hollow Bastion adds 1,152 kills to the Cage 2 counter. If you take our cannon kill count from Cage 1, 782, and add our pre Hollow Bastion Cage 2 count, 358, you get 1,140. So Sora literally doubles his kill count in this one visit, which is pretty insane. With that, we embark on our second tour across the world, with the Cage 2 counter now resting at 1,510. So our first obstacle in the back half is this Riku fight in Land of Dragons. And when I first got here, I was so upset. This appeared to be the trickiest wrinkle in the project so far. It seemed like these innocent rapid thrusters were doomed to die, or at least some of them were. The goal in this Riku fight is to get his HP to a certain threshold, and then the fight ends. Hypothetically, I suppose you could be very careful with your attacks, unequip any moves with a wider range of effect, and slowly whittle Riku's health down. The problem with this, though, is that Riku will kill the Rapid Thrusters himself with his own attacks to the point where taking your time and taking care not to kill any Rapid Thrusters will drag the fight out long enough for Riku to kill way more than necessary. And of course, those kills even go towards your journal kill count. So I initially thought that a pacifist player's best bet was to just try and end the fight as quickly as possible to reduce casualties. But then I noticed that only some of Riku's attacks seem to actually damage or kill the Thrusters, most noticeably Helm Split. His basic sword combo seemed to either not damage the thrusters, or the ones that got hit would despawn before their HP could hit zero. So basically, you just need to beat Riku without letting him use that helm split attack. I essentially turned the rapid thrusters into an unwitting Pikmin squad that wants to kill me, corralling them away from Riku who never does helm split from a distance. Meanwhile, using my newly acquired Photon Debugger keychain, I cast Thunder on Riku when I find time between dodging the thrusters and Riku both staying still and being far enough away from me and the army I have drafted. Initially, this seems like a dumb idea since surely the Thunder spells will hit the myriad rapid thrusters floating in the air above Riku, but those are fake, painted-on, Roadrunner Tunnel rapid thrusters. They're not actually tangible. All the real, interactable rapid thrusters are currently bunched up behind me trying to stab me in the ass. So, that's the solution. Dodge roll in a big circle around Riku while finding your window to cast Thunder. Mind you, this was still very arduous and took somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes. I managed to speed it up a little bit by bringing some MP restoring items, but they weren't enough to carry me to the end of the battle, so I spent a lot of time waiting for my MP to fill back up. But slowly but surely, it worked. You're fucking welcome, you little bumblebee bastards. After that, we've got a straightforward mob battle in the Imperial Square with four bolt towers and three assault riders, and then, of course, the Storm Rider boss fight. We leave Land of Dragons with only eight more kills, 1,518 total. Beast Castle continues to be fairly benevolent toward the Heartless, as none need to die during the second visit, given that all of the force fights here are against nobodies. Outside of worlds that never feature combat, Beast Castle ends up being the least bloody of every Disney world in the number of titles, go figure. Like the Pride Lands, the second Olympus Coliseum visit is also optional, so we'll put that aside for now. That takes us to Port Royal 2, which is mainly concerned with the gamblers and the medallions, so the only Heartless who dies here is, ironically, the Grim Reaper for 1519. Agrabah is, again, pretty violent, with a ton of Heartless dying during a carpet ride slightly less romantic than the source material. During the sequence with Jafar's Shadow, we send 10 Rapid Thrusters, 5 Fortune Tellers, 3 Hook Bass, and 1 Crimson Jazz to a whole new world. The world is hell. Any world with the Crimson Jazz in it is hell. The next part is slightly annoying, but killing the Heartless chasing you during the Switches segment can be avoided despite how closely they fly near you and the fact that you'll have to use magic right next to them. I found the easiest way was to go to the Blizzard Switches first, since that one gave me the most trouble, so if I killed something, I would let myself get killed, because I take Heartless Preservation deathly seriously. Then the Thunder Switches, which you can usually lock onto and cast on before the Heartless are close enough to it. 
I saved the fire switches for last since you can just get in the middle of it and end the segment once you cast, keeping any Heartless in your vicinity from dying, which they might if you did this one first or second. The carpet escape sequence is going to guarantee some Heartless deaths due to how pillars or tornadoes will kill some out of your control, upon which they're added to your journal kill counter. There's also this one part where a bunch of them just fucking explode for seemingly no reason. I ran this a couple times, and the lowest I could get the deaths here was 19 rapid thrusters and 8 hook bats. Sometimes some extra hook bats can survive if they manage to weave through the falling buildings or twisters, and I wouldn't be surprised if this number could be brought down a bit more. But with that, we leave Agrabah behind after claiming an additional 46 kills for 1,565 total. That takes us to the second Halloween Town visit, which is very light on the murder. Four white knights during the present retrieval, and... Oh man, this fucking guy. Yeah, so the experiment is like infamously unclear on what the fuck it is. It sort of looks and acts like a Heartless, and it grants you an experience point for wisdom form, but it's also not listed under Heartless in the journal. A journal which notes it does not have a heart, and Heartless, despite the name, are hearts, which this thing does not release when killed. So I feel pretty confident in not counting it. We didn't murder another Heartless here, we just murdered this creature who was born a few minutes ago and wants nothing more than a heart of his own. No big deal. And believe it or not, if we're going as pacifist as possible in Cage 2, that's the end of the road. After this, we can move on to Twilight Town and The World It Never Was, neither of which have mandatory Heartless battles. So that brings our counter to 1,569. Of course, I'm pretty sure Sora canonically did all of the visits to each Disney World in the game, so we'll add those on for our second answer. In Pride Lands, there's just two Living Bones at the start of the first visit, and I mean, I don't see why Scar wouldn't count. And on the second visit, only the Ground Shaker needs to be defeated, so Pride Lands adds another 4 total. Then there's Olympus 2, and all of the murdering there takes place during the mini Hades Cup. That's 3 Driller Moles, 2 Tornado Steps, 1 Morning Star, 1 Crescendo, and 1 Shit-Fucking Crimson Jazz. There are 6 Minute Bombs in one round, but if you cast fire on them, none of them technically count as a kill. Unlike at the building site, the bombs won't respawn, presumably thanks to this being a tournament with a set amount of participants. Unlike the cups in Cage 1, I don't really have reason to believe that Sora did everything up through the Hades Paradox Cup in Cage 2, so I'm gonna leave those off both lists. This means Olympus 2 adds another 8 kills, which leaves us with Hollow Bastion and Space Paranoids 2. Arriving in Hollow Bastion eventually forces you into another Burrow battle against 4 Strafers and 1 Devastator. Then inside Space Paranoids, the Light Cycle mob fight adds another 6 Magnum Loaders and 2 Devastators. We have another mob fight in the IO Tower hallway with 5 Strafers and 4 Devastators. The last mob fight takes place on a Solar Sailor for an additional 7 Strafers, 7 Magnum Loaders, and 5 Devastators. And that's it. There's some Strafers that spawn during the Sark fight, but you can avoid killing any of them. So with that, our Cannon Cage 2 kill count extends to 1622. If you add that to the Cannon Cage 1 count, we're at a grand total of 2,404. Adding the true pacifist counts from both games together results in a much more modest 1,800. With that, we do not move on to Recoded because Datasaur isn't real and who could possibly care about him? And obviously Sora isn't killing any Heartless in Dream Drop, only Dream Eaters, which, good. That brings us to the final leg of our murder tour, Kingdom Hearts 3. Heartless! So, kicking off Cage 3 is our small combat tutorial, which is a bit more peaceful than Cage 1's, with three shadows and one dark side. Things really ramp up in Olympus, which features a host of forced mob fights, the first of which is at the Cliff Ascent, where we take out four soldiers, three air soldiers, three shadows, and one large body. Later on, when Hercules joins the party, we have another mandatory battle against ten flame cores, plus another ten at the Overlook. Afterwards, when the party rescues the DID, that's another six flame cores. The timed crumbling building mob fight sends a healthy supply of Heartless into the meat grinder, with 20 flame cores, 10 shadows, 5 soldiers, and 4 air soldiers meeting their end here. There is a rock troll fight not long after, and as long as we kill that first, we can spare the soldiers that spawn alongside it. On the climb up the mountain, the game will show us some mini cutscenes of air soldiers and water cores, but they can be skipped entirely. Then there's actually two ways you can progress up the mountain, either through the Zeus statue room from earlier or up a waterfall, both areas triggering a forced mob fight when you arrive. It appears that the waterfall fight spawns 11 water cores, while taking the route through the statue room requires you to kill 10 earth cores, so that'll be the path we take. Finally, in Olympus proper, we're greeted by 25 satyrs whom we swiftly send to Hades, and so we leave KH 2.9 with 116 kills already logged. Next, we make a brief stop in Twilight Town with not too much to do since our first fight here is a swarm of nobodies, followed by a demon tide that we can't kill. The kills ramp up in the woods though, when the gang rescues Little Chef in exchange for the lives of 23 Power Wilds. After that, there's the mobs sent by Ansem and Xemnas, half of which are Dusks, which are paired up with 12 Neo Shadows. I feel like Neo Shadows and Dusks are not on equal power levels, so this was always strange to me, but I digress. That puts us at 151. 
Heading to Toy Box, it seems like we'll finally have to kill some Gummy Heartless. Even though we can essentially skip over any encounters by simply not flying near them, our arrival in certain worlds is blocked by boss enemies. Here we have the Astro Warrior standing between us and Toy Box, but through a bit of speedrun strat trickery, we can completely bypass this guy. The timing isn't too difficult either. You essentially just enter the battle, skip the cutscene, and then click in the stick to do a U-turn. If you do it right, you can U-turn again and just fly past the boss into the darkness-obscured Toy Box. We've done some pretty cheesy things to avoid killing so far, but this is probably the closest thing to a glitch we've used, so I'd understand if you'd still want to count this as a kill. But I will not because I'm trying to lay in Sora's sentence. Arriving in Andy's room, we've got a run-of-the-mill mob fight against 16 Toy Troopers, 8 Shadows, 2 Gold Beats, and 2 Vermilion Sambas. Then we arrive at Galaxy Toys, whereupon we'll be fighting a bunch of Giguses. Or, or is it just Gigas? A Gigai? Gigi? The mechs aren't heartless themselves, they're just piloted by toy troopers, so depleting a robot's HP causes the trooper inside to eject and explode, which will happen 14 times here. The same thing goes for anything possessed by marionettes, which we first see with the three Supreme Smashers, all of which contribute to the marionette kill count in the journal. This also applies to Angelic Amber not long after. The only other real moment of interest in this world is the UFO chase, which you can get through without killing any heartless as long as you're careful. Although, the UFO has a Heartless emblem on it, and there's no journal entry for it, but you also don't get a Toy Trooper or a Marionette kill when you defeat it, but it also doesn't release a heart, so I guess we'll not count this as a kill. Everything left here is pretty straightforward, a bunch of mob fights keeping you from moving the green blocks in the Kid Corral. When all of those are dealt with, we add 26 pole cannons, 22 toy troopers, 9 marionettes, and soon after, 1 king of toys. I hate that I even noticed this, but the king of toys is the 104th mandatory heartless kill in this world. You know, 104, like the building you fight Yazora on, Yazora from Virum Rex from the commercial that plays at the start of this world, Virum Rex, Rex meaning king, like king of toys. I've cracked the code, and or am on crack. Anyway, we blast off from Toy Box with 255 kills. Next up is Kingdom of Corona, which is the most cut and dry world so far. We start with a forced mob fight in the forest, racking up 14 puffballs, 10 bizarre archers, and 6 malachite boleros. Our next scripted battle is the absolute onslaught of puffballs, featuring a few chief puffs that'll rapidly reproduce into a puffball tower. I thought maybe they could be killed before they do this, but even with easy codes on, they're scripted to grow every time and invincible until they do, so you sadly can't save the lives of a few extra puffballs. Which means we'll be killing 84 of the poor fucks, along with 5 of their chiefs. Next up is the Chaos Carriage mini-boss, preceded by murdering 27 Power Wilds. I always thought the carriage was just one entity with multiple parts, but the journal says this was actually three separate Heartless, so add them to the list we shall. All that's left here is the final mob fight at the tower before Grim Guardianus, with six Puffballs, six Chief Puffs, five Malachite Boleros, and five Marine Roombas, followed by Gothel herself. And would you look at that, the world named the Kingdom of Corona was the deadliest world so far, and spoilers, the deadliest world in the game, with 168 kills being added for a running total of 423. This is followed by Monstropolis, which, like Toy Box, is defended by the Dreadshark Gummy Heartless, which we will also skip by U-turning. Monstropolis is much lighter on our count, since a bulk of the enemies fought here are unversed, which are like Heartless that just have bad relationships with their dads, but are still a different species. That makes this world very by the books. There's the Make Boo Laugh segment, where Boo giggles uncontrollably at the demise of 19 soldiers, 8 Vermilion Sambas, 5 Marine Roombas, and 2 large bodies. There's this forced electric fence battle with 9 gold beats and 2 soldiers, followed by this less monochromatic scene of the fire, adding 4 flame cores. The last forced fight here is another battle in the Inferno, racking up another 5 flame cores, 7 soldiers, 3 Vermilion Sambas, and 2 large bodies. Of course, the lump is also an unversed, so we cap off our stint as exterminators at 489 kills. Moving on to Arendelle, which is similar to Monstropolis in that we end up fighting a ton of Larkseen's ninja nobodies in the labyrinth which don't add to our count. But Sora does kill a soldier in the opening cutscene here, and we are counting that. Our first relevant fight here is the battle against the Rock Troll, which will kill alongside 13 Winterhorns. Then, way later, after being chased by the Frost Serpents, we will kill all three of them. Besides the boss, everything left comes from the mob fight after finding Olaf. Everything did look like Olaf until we coated the snow in heartless blood from 10 winter horns, 8 flutterings, and 4 satyrs. All that's left is furry Hans, which brings our count up to 530. Next up is the Caribbean, which is even less violent than the last two worlds, especially if you don't count any of the ships you sink as kills. I did because they're noted as heartless ships, though I don't know exactly how much crew is on board, if any, but I just counted each sunken ship as one kill. So we kick off with two Anchor Raiders in the locker, which by the way, be careful not to accidentally kill any Earth Cores if you're using Blizzard to chase the Pearl. This is followed by the Raging Vulture boss, which you can take out without killing any innocent Vapor Flies. Then there's good old Big Fish, followed by two Pirate Ships we have to sink for this tutorial, which again, we'll just count as two kills here. 
We have a group of mobs to kill on Luxord's ship, which you can board without having to sink any others. This includes 16 Spear Lizards, 3 Anchor Raiders, and 2 Large Bodies. Last order of business here is the fleet of pirate ships that block our way to Shipwreck Cove. There is an initial fleet of 10 to sink, and then the boss ship spawns with a bunch of smaller ships around it. You only need to sink this main one to end the fight, so you can spare the other vessels. That brings us up to 568 as we head into San Francisco. So the San Fran trip pretty much boils down to two mob fights, the first of which is on the bridge when you arrive, and that nets us 20 pole cannons, 12 tire blades, and one metal troll, the last of which you can kill without defeating any additional tire blades that spawn alongside it. Later on, we have a forced fight on a rooftop, which gives us 11 soldiers, 10 mechanitars, and 4 high soldiers. During the Big Hero 6 rescue portion, there is this part where you need to save Gogo -Go by using the red Shugio ball, and it can be difficult, but it's definitely possible to steer around any heartless that spawn on the street. Beyond that, all that's left is the Catastrochorus and the Dark Cubes, which I guess we're just going to count as one Heartless, unless anyone feels like counting the individual cubes. With that, we head into the endgame with 628 kills. So even though Riku does the majority of the fighting against the Demon Tower in the Dark World, Sora does help him finish it off, or at least it looks that way. It sort of just spits Mickey out and we don't actually see it fade away or explode or anything, but I'm going to count it. And again, I know this is obviously a swarm of many, many shadows, but given that there's no real way to count them all up, as well as the journal having a separate entry for the tides and towers, we'll count it as one kill. And okay, maybe there is a way to estimate how many shadows are in there, but not without getting into some, like, game theory territory. I'm not about to sit here and do mass times volume equals density, or whatever the fuck it is they do. As we fly to the Keyblade Graveyard, after nearly three entire games, we're forced to fight a Gummy Heartless, as there's no way to U-turn away from the Colossus Pyramid. Once again, it's hard to say if this thing constitutes one Heartless or many, or if there's like a bunch of Stormtrooper Heartless on board keeping the thing running, but for our purposes, we're gonna count it as one. After that's dealt with, we land in the Keyblade Graveyard and are treated to the Battle of a Million Bad Guys, and this is really interesting. So I mean, it looks like there's an uncountable amount of Heartless here, but these are, once again, mostly painted on Roadrunner Tunnel Heartless. Plus, they're not all Heartless, we have a mixture of Nobodies and Unversed in here as well. The goal here is to deplete the bar in the top left enough to get the roller coaster attraction flow with which you can pretty quickly end the battle. So my first thought was to prioritize killing the nobodies and unversed to minimize heartless casualties. This works, but only for a while as eventually the bar will stall in place until you take out some heartless. But focusing on the other two enemy types as often as possible can still help. Once you get the roller coaster, even though blasting into the crowd grants you experience, the journal doesn't seem to add on any heartless casualties considering I only had three more shadow kills in my journal after this fight. So it seems to only take the ones you kill while grounded into account, in which case this battle adds 60 air soldiers, 60 flutterings, 4 rock trolls, and the aforementioned 3 shadows. Which, to be honest, probably could have been spared, I would not be surprised if it's doable without killing any shadows, believe it or not. You know what, send me a video of you doing the fight with as few casualties as you can manage, and if you get a lower number, I'll update the count in a comment. And that goes for any other grey areas throughout the video, like the mini escort or the carpet escape in Agrabah. Anyway, from here, all that's left now are a couple of single entities, the first of which is the Lich. Full disclosure, I don't know if it's possible to kill him on a normal playthrough without taking out any mooks, but using easy codes makes it very doable. Since the game gives those to you, I think it's fair to consider them legitimate for this. After we get back to the Land of the Living, we get revenge on the Demon Tide, which, again, counting as one entity. Then we kill Ansem, again, and I guess technically we can either not count this one or the first one, but this is a second instance of murder, so we'll just say we killed Ansem twice. Just like in KH1, Ansem is the last Heartless to die here, at least in the base game. Remind adds in the mandatory Dark Inferno X, or Kai, as well as this mob fight in Scala at Kylum with a shadow containing a Kyrie Heart piece, which you can also kill first and end the sequence without killing anything else. And finally, we take out the Kyrie Dark side, giving us our final Heartless kill across the numbered titles. Unlike KH1 and 2, KH3 doesn't really have any optional or skippable combat stuff besides the battle gates, which I don't really have reason to believe are canon. Of the three games, it's definitely the most straightforward when it comes to this exercise, but still fairly violent as we end with one solitary kill count of 763. When going by our true pacifist counts, if it weren't for the Battle of a Thousand Heartless and KH2, KH3 would be the deadliest of the trilogy by about 200 kills. And when we add up our counts from across the games, we get the answer we set out to find with this project. When playing as pacifistically as possible, Sora has killed 2,563 Heartless. For a more canon-friendly number, the answer is 3,167. So, now we have that information. I... I wanted to know the answer, so I did this, and now you all know it too, and the video's over. Cool. Good. Wow, that's a lot of killing, huh? Gee. I hope you enjoyed that, um, I hope it was interesting. 
I thought it was interesting for like the first two thirds. And to be honest, KH3, was, there wasn't a ton to say with that game. Uh, I feel like one and two, and especially one, had a bunch of stuff that you could kind of like, you know, finagle your way through stuff. And there were like different routes you could take to avoid death. But the further you get into the number titles, the more it kind of seems cut and dry. So I know at a point it was just me like listing dead heartless. But, you know, the whole point was to get the number and... Uh, I couldn't help how interesting it got towards the uh, the end of the line there. If you're curious, throughout my research for this, I put together a spreadsheet that shows the totals of all the different species and the totals across all of the worlds in the numbered titles, because you gotta have a spreadsheet. I don't know how to make these videos anymore without some spreadsheet getting shoehorned into it, so. If you're looking for me on other social medias, Twitch, Discord, Twitter, that's all at regularpat.com. That's like a hub for all of my nonsense online and also especially important is the patreon i saw a huge influx of support from my last video i guess because i sort of had a pitch at the beginning of it and it seemed to resonate with people but i greatly appreciate that thank you so much if you're interested in joining up there that is patreon.com slash regular pat all right thank you so much for watching i'll see you in the next one until then take it easy bye